the Atacama Desert. This is the driest desert on earth. They have grown vines in the desert, but it's a cool climate. So it's about 20 kilometers from the coast. These cooling breezes coming in. So surprisingly, this desert doesn't reach more than 26 degrees Celsius. The soils are super salty, 60 times more salty than is possible to grow vines. They have found a watering system where if you flood irrigate in one hit, it pushes the water down to the roots and the salt up to the surface. And that way you separate it and you can actually give the vines the water they need. It's just a very crazy project, creating very low yields, more concentrated flavors. So there's beautiful Pinot Noir, Chardonnay and Syrah, and they're unfiltered, unfined, bottled by hand, pressed by feet. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 171. Are you curious about English wines and their history that dates back to King Henry VIII? How is wine made in the driest place on earth? And where is that exactly? Are stemless wine glasses better than traditional stemware? You'll hear those stories and more during part two of our chat with Yanina Doyle, who hosts her own podcast, Eat, Sleep, Wine, Repeat. You don't need to have listened to part one from last week first, but I hope you'll go back if you missed it after you finish this one. One of you will win a one-hour online masterclass with Yanina, tailored to you and which wines you have access to and what you want to learn about. You can have the class just for yourself or gather a whole group together. To qualify, all you have to do is email me at natalie at nataliemcclain.com and tell me that you heard about this giveaway on the podcast. I'll pick one of you randomly to win it. Now, if you're listening to this podcast on or before March 12th, I'd like to invite you to an outrageously fun online drink and drag wine party, unlike any other wine tasting you've ever attended. Join Queenston winemaker Rob Power and me Saturday, March 12th at 7 p.m. Eastern. This entertaining over-the-top virtual event will feature the queens of Queenston Mile Vineyard, Katinka Couture and Carlotta Carlisle. Get your groove on with wine in hand. Enjoy the queens on the main stage sporting their favorite wines, bodacious bobs, over-the-top makeup, and glamorous wigs dancing to their favorite songs. End the evening in an online session lounges featuring local music and a fun Q&A with Rob, Katinka, Carlotta, and yours truly. Drink and Drag will be hosted online and your virtual event link will be emailed to you in advance of the event. I can't wait to see you there. And yes, I'm still debating which of my Fluvog shoes to wear. I'll put a link in the show notes as to where you can get your ticket before they sell out. Can't make this date? Buy your ticket today and sip on the wines as you watch the replay. Hey, that rhymes. (laughs) Now, on a personal note, before we dive into the show with the continuing story of publishing my new wine memoir, why so much Hobbit hate? One of my beta readers asked me recently, Don't get me wrong. I love the Lord of the Rings books and movies, and I even quote some of the author J.R.R. Tolkien's insightful phrases in my memoir. However, I do write about getting back into the dating game following my divorce after 20 years of marriage. In the book, I meet with the owner of a matchmaking company, and I say to her, look, I don't want to date a man I can easily throw over my shoulder, and no more hairy hobbits. No more what? She asked me, short man with lots of back hair, I said. So hobbits are the heroes in Tolkien stories, but not as a real life dinner and dancing companion when you're almost five foot ten and his head nuzzles into your tummy or slightly higher. Oh, that'll be a challenge, she sighed. At least come down to five foot eight. 
what? A guy who's shorter than I am? I can't do it. Though I'll compromise on the back hair. He can shave that if he truly loves me. She just shook her head and rolled her eyes. So my Veda reader said, you know, that Hobbit comment, it's a real gut punch for shorter guys. Actually, I said, it's more of a swat across the top of your forehead, but let's not nitpick. (laughs) I really don't have anything against hobbits or short men. It was awkward and scary dating again, especially after being off the market, so to speak, for two decades. And at that point, I really didn't know who I was, much less what I really wanted or needed in a companion, or even if I wanted one. There's more in the memoir about these romantic escapades outside the Shire. In the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 171, you'll find a link to a blog post called Diary of a Book Launch, where I share more behind the scenes stories about the journey of taking this memoir from idea to publication. If you want a more intimate insider seat beside me on this journey, please let me know that you'd like to become a beta reader and get a sneak peek at the manuscript. Email me at natalie at nataliemclean.com. In the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 171, you'll find my email contact, a link to the Drink and Drag event, the full transcript of my conversation with Yanina, links to her website and podcast, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find the live stream video version of these conversations on Facebook and YouTube Live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Okay, on with the show. Tell us about the connection between your wines and King Henry VIII and something called the Doomsday Book. Okay, so in the Doomsday Book, well, they don't ask me to talk about history too much. What is that, by the way? Oh, do you know what? Oh my God, I'm going to look so bad for my history. I can't believe you've asked me that. But it's a record of a lot of stuff and it was after some fighting and stuff. We're going to leave it there. So the Doomsday Book is really important. <laughs> like an almanac or whatever, predictions, maybe. Uh, no, it wasn't predictions. It's was definitely records. Okay. But everybody go Google. Google's our friend. I'm terrible history. But in the Doomsday Book in 1086, that is when Night Timber was first mentioned. So they know that the history of basically the area was like kind of named after the valley, but inside the valley is like the house, the house that apparently still stands, or at least part of it. It was called Night Timber. It had a slight different twist. It wasn't quite Night Timber. It had a little bit of a different name, but it was there. And then you state about King Henry VIII. I mean, that's the best of the Tudors, right? You know, he was going around killing everyone and being really intense. And everyone loves he the liked l- his food bloody and drink. history. <laughs> he did. Apparently, he started off actually quite skinny and he was very physical. And then he got super fat by the end. But <laughs> he got hold of this property and he first of all gave it to Thomas Cromwell, who was his fave at the time. So he was one of the ministers, they were besties. Um, I believe, again, I actually know some of the history of the Tudors, not the Doomsday Book. So the history of the Tudors, he then goes and kills him because that's what King Henry VIII did. I think probably got his head chopped off or whatever because he didn't like him anymore. And then one of his wives, because of course he had six, was Anne of Cleves and he gave it to her. She was one of the lucky ones. She didn't get killed. They got annulled. I don't know. I think she wasn't sexy enough, whatever. Anyway, so I guess she had to give it back. I don't know. So anyway, this night timber not only has created the effect of people planting more sparkling champagne grape varieties and where we are today, but they have an incredible history. And as we said, like the Tudors and the War of the Roses, it's an awesome, well, probably wasn't awesome for them, but it's awesome stories for us to learn about. Absolutely. It's it's amazing the connection that they have. Yeah, yeah. The fact that wine is tied in way back to then. So thinking about English wines and traditional English dishes, what are some of your favorite pairings? There's one and that's it. All right. And it's fish and chips. Classic. It's fish and chips because one, that is literally probably the most classic English dish. But two, sparkling wine has beautiful acidity. So you could do this with champagne or you could do this with English sparkling wine. It doesn't matter. But with an English sparkling wine, it's going to cut through the grease, the fat. Of course, it's that lovely white cod or it's a fresh fillet that's going to go beautifully with this lovely, especially like a classic cuvee rather than, say, a Blanc de Noir or something. But it works perfectly. And English sparkling wine is on par in terms of pricing like champagne. So there's something quite indulgent about having a pretty 
expensive bottle of wine with a good old takeaway fish and chips, maybe not even on a plate, you know, just open up the wrapper and just it's all greasy and messy and it's a bit dirty and it's yummy. So. Yes. I love that. High, low, shabby, chic pairings. <laughs> They're always the most fun. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. What wines or brands are we most likely to find in Canada or the US, the big names? Would Night Timber be here or are they too small a production, I guess? No, 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 no. They are one of the bigger ones. Night Timber and Ridgeview. Ridgeview, I know they told me they were exporting and they make stunning wines. They often have their wines in, you know, House of Common, House of Parliament, the Queen's birthday sort of thing. They've won so many awards. And again, their winemaker recently won one of the, you know, best winemaker of the year. I wrote down Apparently there is in America. It's very hard. You know, when you use Google, it knows where you are, your location, and it won't take you to Canada or America. But Vine Street Imports is importing Harrow and Hope, Bolney. I love Bolney for their still wines, actually. Hush Heath. I have one of their bottles. They're an amazing Kent producer that does great sparkling and still. So get on the Hush Heath. And also Digby Fine Wine. So that's definitely in America. Now, whether that stretches to Canada, but the fact that they're going to America, I think would be... So other than that, Night Timber, Ridgeview, and also Chapel Down is our biggest winery. I recognize that one. I'm pretty sure we've had that one in Canada. Yeah. I am sure you would find Chapel Down. And Chapel Down is great. I like to use the kind of explanation if you think of Penfolds in Australia you know they have the kind of level entry wines you might find as a house pour and then of course they've got Penfolds Grange and they have everything in between Chapel Down are kind of like that they have your cheaper end and when I say cheap we don't do cheap scale of economy in England you might find a 10 pound bottle of wine so you might find like a 15 dollars but really, the stills start at, say, $20, 25 and your sparklings are going to start 25 30 Really, the good stuff starts at $40. So, yeah, but Chapel Down does the lowest level all the way to the top. Great. All right. So we should taste, and we'll talk more about the Chilean wine that you have with you. But you have two wines, so tell us about the first one you'd like to taste. We're talking English wine, aren't we? So I suppose I should do that. And I have my oh, oh and the Coravan. I have my Coravan. Yes. Although this is literally the first Coravan that ever, ever was made. Do you know which edition we're on now? I have no idea, but I would love to on this bottle or the next, if you can. I don't know if you can do this mid-air on the camera, but we can try. Tell us first what the Coravan is for people who are just listening to the podcast and can't see you on video, although you do have to find the video of us here, folks, and watch this demonstration. So yeah, tell us. Yes, exactly. Okay, so it's got this argon gas in the bottom of it. And then you have this needle. So the needle goes through the cork. Once it's gone through, you literally push the little button. What it does, it sucks out the wine through the needle and then comes out into a glass. But then the gas will then go into the bottle. So it replaces that area where the wine was. So it seals it so it's not going to oxidize. Now, it's an amazing piece of kit. They do try to claim that if you use this Coravan, you can preserve your wine for years. That's so not true. If you speak to many people, I always say a month. It's very dependent on the cork and how porous it is and all this kind of stuff. But it's amazing if you've got a whole bottle and you're by yourself and you might want just one glass a week or perhaps your partner's pregnant or you're pregnant and you want just something very smaller. It just It's amazing that then over the course of I say four weeks, that's where you're going to get the ultimate enjoyment before oxidization starts maybe coming in. I just think it's really, it's fancy. So all I do, and I'll try and do it because I'm going to kind of hold it up. So you clip it on. Okay. The neck of the bottle. Yeah. On the neck of the bottle. Obviously you then hold on to the bottle and we just push it down. I'm, like, I'm going to push it on my stomach. Hang on. Can I, there we go. Thank you. Uh, there we go. Do it. Pushing the needle into the cork. Yeah, exactly. Now I'm going to have to put it on a hard surface. Right. It's not working. There we go. <laughs> I don't want you to break a we... rib there. <laughs> oh, almost. <laughs> so there we go. So it's now in the bottle. And then all I'm going to do, and I'm actually probably not going to be able to show you, so I'll just, I'm going to put, oh, can I? No, I can't. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> okay. So I've got my glass and then I'm just going to push it down. And then I can tell you right now, you can't see wine is coming out. <laughs> so wine is coming out inside the bottle. It's being replaced with argon gas. So we're all good. And I am now pouring myself without opening up the bottle. I am pouring myself a glass of Pinot Noir. So I decided to bring a curveball because 
there aren't that many producers that can do good Pinot Noir. But Hush Heath Estate, all of their wines, actually, just to confuse everyone, are called Balfour. So the actual wines are Balfour, but the estate is Hush Heath. So it kind of gets used interchangeably. And you can see this is a very, very cool label. So they always get artists to do a design for this collection. So it's called the Winemaker's Collection. So it's basically limited edition, tiny, tiny plot where the winemakers really play around. I know there's like 5,000 bottles of this made. So unfortunately, this is probably not going to be in the US, but this is 2018. So if anyone ever wants a red variety, which is most likely going to be Pinot Noir if it's England, you're actually going to get a wine that's probably ripe enough. Any other year? Maybe not so much. Was 2020 good for you? It was really hot here. Yes. Yeah. 19 and 20, basically. Not as good as 18. Nothing was ever as good as 18, really. But yeah, not so bad. Yields down a little bit, but still good enough to produce some pretty good fruit. They're saying 2021, I need to speak to winemakers. We had a really, we had like three weeks of constant rain in May. That's that really screwed up. Absolutely. So I think it basically from speaking to different winemakers, it's hit or miss. I spoke to one winemaker who's into organic and biodynamic farming. He lost a third of all of his vines. I spoke to another winemaker and they were kind of okay. So it depends, I think, where you were. This is called the suitcase, the suitcase Pinot Noir. And it's called that because, funny enough, in America, they took some Burgundy clones from top Grand Cru sites, 777 clone and 828. Actually, I think it's on the back of the... Yes, 828. So these are top, top Pinot Noir clones. And they took them like illegally to America in the 60s. So they were called suitcase clones because they were snuck in suitcases. So because they're using the top two Burgundy clones, and obviously if you use the right clones, it makes such a difference with Pinot Noir. And so even in England where it's really, really tough with these clones, apparently, I haven't tasted it yet, apparently you can make some very, very special, they're tiny berries, so you get very low yields, but then the flavor is more concentrated. Hence why this is limited. They're not making a lot of it. And I just thought I would bring it along today. Absolutely. So I'll give you a chance to taste oh. there while you... <laughs> what are it you getting on the good. nose? Yeah. Are you getting like berries and that type of thing? I am, which is good. So that's the one tick, right? A Pinot Noir typically obviously is going to give you, if it's good, red fruits and hopefully maybe a little earthy, savory herbal note. And this really has some dried flowers and red cherries. And it's like, I get some dried roses and a little bit of kind of even some thyme in there. So it's a lot more subtle. It's not about big, juicy red strawberries and raspberries. It's not just big boom of red fruits, which sometimes as an example, cheaper Pinot Noir and the New World will produce. This actually is definitely just on the nose and much more of a nod to Burgundy, which is you know, more of the savory, mushroomy. In fact, it almost even has a bit of a hint of truffle, truffle mm. mushroom. So oh, it's lovely. Lovely, lovely on the nose. Wow. Seems delicate. Yeah. Pinot is my go-to wine and grape personally. It's the one I'm always drinking. I just find it so versatile and I love that it isn't heavy in oak, alcohol, or tannin usually. Absolutely. And you can have it with fish, everyone. You can have it with chicken. It really <laughs> yes. is. People think red wine needs to go with red meat, but Pinot Noir totally destroys that theory. And salmon, it's beautiful. But do you know, this is very elegant. It's very ethereal. It's very, very light and not thin because that's very, very different when it just tastes watery. It's got a slight smokiness to it but just very, very beautiful fruits and almost like more wild strawberries. It's a little bit more like you feel like you're outside in the garden. It's lovely. And I expected it to be lovely. So I'm glad it's not bad because it's not cheap. It's not cheap at all. It would probably be about maybe $35 or so if it was in America. So probably 45 here, <laughs> 45, 50 in Canada, 30% markup usually on the US dollar. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's not talk about that. That doesn't sound fun. That's all right. That's okay. I'll drink for you. Yes. Absolutely. That's wonderful. That sounds like a great Pinot to have. And I love the suitcase story. <laughs> oh, it's really nice. I'm so glad I've still got more. I'm just going to, now, now I'm allowed to drink, right? Yes, absolutely. You've officially opened the bottle and yeah, it's all research. I'm researching for you and yeah, no, no, no. English wine's still good. Well, good. It's good to have that confirmed. <laughs> oh dear. You've also got a wine from Chile. Tell us about that wine and your association with the winery. Okay, fine. So this is the wine and it's very different. And I picked it just because it's varieties that most people might not have heard of. 
well, certainly Pais, Pais, which is a red grape variety, and it's got 15% Muscatel. So Muscat, people probably have heard of. And people often think that Muscat is always sweet. Well, that's not true. You can have dry Muscat, so that's absolutely fine. Now, i tell you what, quick tip. If you are opening up your wine, take the point of your bottle opener. Also, friends... Don't use the little man with his wings. No, 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 no. If you've yeah. got one at the man, like he has to go. Yes. He has to go. Always take a little waiter's friend, one of these little things. Yeah, the basic corkscrew. Yep. And they're really cheap. So you take the point, but many people would go here, which is on the top lip. Don't do that. So if you want to be professional, you go to the bottom lip and you go to the bottom lip for two reasons. One, it looks much neater. It just looks much nicer Nicely and done cleaner. With the foil. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, it was quite an easy one. Sometimes they're not as easy. So one, that. And two, when you go to pour, you haven't then got a whole load of like messy foil at the top, which could then take your wine and then it will dribble everywhere. And so it looks nicer, but actually it makes life easier with pouring. So there's a little tip for everyone. Yeah. So And then, of course, take your little spiral, put it directly I don't know, you probably got directly in the middle, push down and twist. And obviously then you are pretty much good to go. And then we can, whoop. Okay, that was a lot easier than doing the core event, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was. Good job. Thank you. So this is just a beautiful wine that is really easy drinking. It would probably be about maybe even $15 in the US. It's from Maole. And the reason I say it, it's just, it's nice to talk about Maole. It's a region that's just... At the beginnings of the southern part of Chile, so it's a little bit cooler. It's still Mediterranean climate, but there's a bit more rain. So because it's a bit fresher and not as hot, you get kind of maybe less alcohol in the wines. There's a lot of old vines because the first vines that ever came to Chile were in Itata and Maule. So vines that are 150 years old, like in this bottle, and 200, 250, so really old vines. And Pais is the original grape variety that came across to Chile from the Canary Islands in Spain, and it's Listan Prieto, and hardly any of it grows in the Canary Islands now. And the majority of this variety, named Pais, meaning country in Spanish, that's what they called it in Chile, is now in Chile. There's a little bit in America, Mission. Anyone who has Mission, it's the same thing, because the missionaries, the Spanish missionaries brought it up. And it's called Chico Criola in Argentina. So there's a little bit in places, but Chile is the main place where you're going to find it. And Pais, I like to call it, it's like a bit like Gamay or Pinot Noir, but more rustic. It looks light in your glass there. It looks lighter, like not too dark. It's just an interesting grape variety that before, because it had a lot of tannin, but it was quite light, nobody wants that kind of wine. But winemakers have learned to soften the tannins, extract more color, concentrate it. But it's a lovely wine. It's fresh, red berries, obviously some rusticity, but quite easy drinking. And the muscatel in this wine makes this wine unique. So this is from Ventiscaro, Ventiscaro Wine Estate. So I work for these guys. So I'm biased. I'm biased, but I work for them because I love them and I think their wines are top, top quality. So you can trust me. And you're transparent. So that's fine. What that reminds me of is that traditional Rhone blend of the Syrah red grape and then a Viognier for the floral lift and lightning. So they're doing some creative blending there between a red primarily wine and then a splash of white. It literally gives you, so you've got all that red berries, a little bit of, and it's also smoky at the same time. It's got real smokiness. So instead of rusticity, it's almost gone a bit smoky, but then lovely orange peachy notes. I don't know if in America or Canada, you have the Petit Falou yogurts, or I mean, I haven't seen them since I was a child. We used to have these Petit Falou yogurts that your mum used to put in your lunchbox. They were actually French, but we had them. It tastes just like a peach petit falou. So I don't know if anyone understands what I'm saying right now. <laughs> That's okay. We had little mini yogurts. I don't know if that was the same brand name, but yeah, I get what you're saying. <laughs> Floral, peachy and yogurty, but lovely red berries and a bit of smoke. So this is a great barbecue wine. You know, you can have it chilled down as well because this doesn't have any oak. Wines that don't have oak or wines that are low in alcohol are great chilled down. So, you know, you could have it ideal temperature, like 10 degrees whilst there's some, you know, sausages on the barbecue or like some, I mean, if we're going to be fancy, like venison charcuterie, you know, because it's got that smoky vibe. Yeah. I mean, that's getting a bit fancy, isn't it? Let's just stick with sausages. Creative. <laughs> <laughs> what happens if you chill an oaked wine? What's happening there? Why doesn't that work? I mean, it's two things really, because a lot of the time as well with oak, it might also be because the wine is probably 
more concentrated, so the alcohol might be higher. Number one, definitely, from my own research, when you've got a lot more alcohol, if you go colder, it's just going to seem a lot more clumsier. And the fruit, as we all know, it's like when you take a beer, and you know it's a rubbish beer, so definitely like put it in the freezer, and then you're like, oh, lovely, it's refreshing, because you've killed Can't all the flavours. smell anything. <laughs> Taste. Right? Yeah. So you basically find that the fruit disappears and then the oak is going to show more. It's just going to take everything out of balance. And the same way, actually, red wine, even a big, powerful, oaky, 15% red should not be above 18 degrees Celsius. Sorry, I'm... We're Celsius. Oh, oh okay. Yay, yay. Okay, screw the Fahrenheit, people. <laughs> I don't know, don't know what it is. Basically, people go, oh, but red's at room temperature. Well, that was before we had central heating. And so actually, if you go too high, like everyone, if you're ever in Spain in the middle of the summer, take your red wine and drink it straight away. It is disgusting. So then with the alcohol levels, it would just be so apparent. It'd just be all alcohol and then nothing else, you know. But obviously it's personal preference. Of course. Whatever you enjoy. Oh, if you like true. a well done steak and you like a 25 degrees red wine, you go for it and you enjoy. <laughs> Let's so. just not have dinner <laughs> together because I don't know where you're coming <laughs> just, from. Just... You don't come to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, that's great. And so you mentioned barbecue wines with this one. And now you have written about the world's driest area to um, make wine. Is that associated with this winery or somewhere else in Chile? No, I'm very, very lucky. So my winery... Ventiscara Wine Estates. I hope they pay me extra for this because this is in my own time. No, no, but they, they are fantastic. They're pioneers. They are all about doing things that are different and they are a premium winery and you can definitely get it in Canada and America. So you're all good. And up in the Atacama Desert, this is the driest desert on earth. We have the only commercial vineyards. So basically they have grown vines in the desert, but it's a cool climate desert. So it's about 20 kilometers, give or take, from the coast. So you have these freezing, cooling breezes coming in. So surprisingly, this desert doesn't reach more than 26 degrees Celsius. Sorry, everyone. Celsius in the middle of summer, in the middle of the afternoon. It's incredible. So it's actually on par with kind of the coolest parts of Leda, which is much further down coastal region in Chile. And you have this incredible fog coming in, which really makes viticulture possible. However, in the Atacama Desert, there are salty soils. So the soils are super salty, apparently like 60 times more salty than is possible to grow vines. So when they first planted, everything died. But long story short, because I know we don't have two and a half more hours to describe how they managed this, they have found a watering system where if you kind of flood irrigate in one hit, it pushes the water down to the roots and the salt up to the surface. And that way you separate it and you can actually give the vines the water they need. Of course, it doesn't rain, so you have to irrigate. But it's just a very crazy project, creating very low yields. Lower yields often, and in this case, it does create more concentrated flavors. So there's beautiful Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Syrah in a range called Tara, so T-A-R-A. And they're unfiltered, unfined, bottled by hand, pressed by feet. So it's all about just terroir, terroir, terroir. They happen to basically be natural. They do a little bit of sulfur in there and they're just gorgeous and then there's also a Sauvignon Blanc as well in the Ventiscaro range and they're just beautiful and you won't find any other wines but from Ventiscaro Wine Estates making these wines in the Atacama Desert and it's just if you're a wine geek you know when you have to take a wine to somebody's house and you want a story behind it yeah and you're like oh which one yeah if you can get a hold of this you know for a fact they're going to be like what oh my god you know so um, and hit me up anyone if you get a bottle and you want to know more and you need all the tasting notes so you can show off. Come, I love talking about this area, this property, because it's so unique. So I'd be very happy to talk about the Atacama Desert for hours. That's great. We'll put a link to the winery and the wines in the show notes. And I'll get at least a few of the wines posted on the site separately, too, so that people, if they're looking for that label, can find them. Because people do like to try some of the wines we talk about on the podcast. Do, do. Yeah. All right. So... This has been so great. I want to finish up with some sort of what I call lightning round questions. Okay, <clears throat> I'm ready. All right, okay. How about, is there something you believe about wine with which a lot of people would disagree with you? Oh, that's difficult. I mean, I tell you what, no, I think I'm quite a conventionalist actually when it comes to wine, but I tell you something that sometimes I have arguments with people, which is, as you may have noticed, wine without a stem. Oh, yes. So 
for me, ultimately, these are Riedel glasses. So the most important thing with the wine glass is that you want it to have like a thin lip so that wine gets into the mouth. It goes in beautifully and it's not clunky. And also you want something with a wide enough bowl so you can swill the glass, the wine around to get the aromas out. That is all you need. The stem for me one, it means you're not going to have dirty fingers if they happen to be dirty on the glass. That's great. But two, it's more just it looks nicer. But sometimes, come on, you're drinking wine, you're having it with pizza. You know, it's a Wednesday night. Like, do you always have to have the fanciest glasses? I think it's nice to bring it down a notch. And actually, if you want to warm up the glass, because maybe the red is actually too cold or maybe the white is too cold, you can still do the exact same thing. I don't have a problem with it. I quite like stemless glasses and also less likely to get knocked over at the table. So if you have a partner like mine who likes to smash all your nice glasses, <laughs> basically <laughs> my Zalto glasses come out just when it's special. And then during the week, we drink from these Riddell glasses, which for two cost me 20 pounds. So what's that? Like maybe 20, 25 dollars. You know, I think they're great. So. No, it's true. It's expensive breaking good wine glasses. I mean, the original, you know, if you want to demystify or de-snob wine. I mean, the original wine glasses were tumblers in bistros, tumbler glasses. They weren't all about fine stemware. So I don't think we need to get too caught up in it. So good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite childhood food that you'd pair with wine as an adult today? So I was thinking about this and the only actual food that I remember that I have such good memories was my mum used to make, she used to take sponge cakes, like a Victoria sponge cake. So again, this is quite English, but I'm sure you guys have it. Victoria sponge cake. So light sponge, cream, bit of jam in there. And then she used to melt chocolate over the top. And that was my birthday cake for years and years and years. Parents just get three of them, then literally decorate them with Smarties or jellies or sprinkles. And like, it's so much cheaper than magical castle cakes, whatever. Anyway, I loved it. And I was thinking about that and I was like, what would I pair with that now? And a braquetto de cuy, which typically you can have still versions, you can have slightly different versions, but the majority are sparkling. It comes from Piemonte. They're very fun wines the majority of the time. They're not too complex. So Northern Italy placing it, yeah. Yes, in Northern Italy. And braquetto is the grape. Aquí is one of the regions, but it can be made in surrounding regions there, but basically Piemonte. And just lovely, beautiful red fruit flavors, lovely sparkling. As I said, generally fun and not too complicated. And it's really good with kind of strawberries and cream or cakes and chocolate. And I just thought, you know, I haven't tried that pairing because I haven't had my cake since I was perhaps 10 years old. I don't know. But the fact you asked me that now, I'm like, I'm going to have to go to my mom and ask her. It's my birthday in April. So oh. do you know what? I think I'm going to get a bottle of Braquetto de Aqui and get her to make me a childhood birthday cake. You bet. You report back on if the pairing works, please. I hope so, because that's what I'm thinking in my head. <laughs> <laughs> High expectations now. That sounds great. Do you have a favorite wine book? Yes, I have wine books. And am I allowed to show three? Yes, of course. We always like good wine book recommendations. Sorry, this is totally classic. Yes. English wine. I know that most of you are going to be like, I don't want to learn about English wine because we don't have much of it, but get on it now because I tell you now, in a few more years, you'll start the trend. He talks about the history of it. I mean, it's crazy. If anyone's been to London, back in even the 1800s, the River Thames used to freeze over and they used to have winter market on the River Thames because there was like an ice age between like the 1400s and the 1850s. Like we've come a long way in terms of climate change. So anyway, everything, all the different grape varieties, all the wineries, everything. It's so beautiful. So it's just a classic, no color pictures. It's all just like wine geeky. The next book I got this year, which I loved by a wonderful author and actually a friend of mine, we met through wine. She's called Amanda Barnes and she's just obsessed with South American wine, and she's a wonderful writer. Literally, it's a beautiful book. You can see it's purple. And inside, there's the most beautiful photos. And it's just, it's just a gorgeous book to read. And you can... Oh, beautiful photos. Yeah. 
That's so funny. I just opened up on the Atacama Desert. Can you see the yes, salt? I can see it. That's yeah. the salt in the soil. That's so, do you know, it's probably, I was going to say, wow, that's fate. It's not. It's probably because I've opened it up on that page more often. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a beautiful book. And I was talking about Bolivian wine on one of my last podcasts. And there was so much information about Bolivia. I mean, there's so much stuff about South America and Peru and so you can really learn about some, it's quite, again, really detailed and quite geeky. And then the last book, it's just a classic, The World Atlas of Wine, Hugh Johnson and Jancis Robinson. This is, this is the latest edition, the eighth. I don't know if I actually prefer the seventh. The seventh, they actually had wine labels in it. So you could kind of just like look for recommendations, but this has more detail and they've changed them. So actually it's not a huge different from the seventh, but there are differences, but they're just incredible for maps. You're not going to get a detailed, crazy amount on a region. You're going to get a nice little overview, but it's so cool to just have a look. And then you've got this map in there and you can see where all the wineries are. And especially when you get to places like Burgundy, that's when you start going, OK, this is complex, but they really map it out. And you can see the Grand Cru sites, the Premier Cru sites, and you can see all the soils and you can. So there are certain things in there that, you know, you can get a bit geeky. So, yeah, they're my faves. Great recommendations. And we'll link to those books as well in the show notes. And we've already talked about your favorite gadget. If there's one person outside the wine world, living or dead, you'd like to share a bottle with, does someone come to mind? Well, firstly, Jesus, because he turned <laughs> Go right to the water top. into wine. Oh, yes. You'd never run out. Wouldn't you want to talk to him? Like, yes. Dude, how did you do that? <laughs> but I imagine he's pretty busy. Great answer. Exactly. So Jesus, number one. And also, plus, if you meet Jesus, he'll be like, do you want to meet my dad? And you'd be like, yeah, do I get a get into heaven free pass? I mean, it could be useful. <laughs> but <laughs> Dalai Lama, oh, Dalai Lama. And you know what? One, because actually, I just love everything about internal peace and happiness and spirituality. And it's my long journey to find beautiful happiness just by myself without the need of anything. But... He has a vineyard. He has the smallest vineyard in the world. Oh, really? So, yeah, he must drink wine. He has a vineyard in Switzerland, in Valais. Huh. Wow. Yeah. So he surely knows something about wine. I would like to talk to him about that. Like, I think it's like there's like three vines. Like, whatever. Why do you have this vineyard in Switzerland? I'd like to talk to him as well. That's interesting. I'd like to get him and Jesus together. Actually, and let's see like the spirituality and like the Christianity. Let's see what happens there. I mean, that could be interesting as well. That could be great, especially if the wine doesn't <laughs> run out. So <laughs> that's great. It hopefully does not. Well, it won't with Jesus around, will it? No, it won't. That's right. And, and since we're already <laughs> into the afterlife here, what wine would you like served at your own funeral? <laughs> it's going to have to be English sparkling wine because a natural answer would be champagne, wouldn't it? Because celebration or commiseration, champagne is the answer. And considering I truly, from the bottom of my heart, believe that English sparkling wine is entirely on par, why would I not have an English sparkling wine when I'm dead? Well, I wouldn't be having it. But of course. Anyway. We'd all raise a glass to you. Yes, yes. We'd remember you fondly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this has been such a great chat, Yanina. Is there anything before we wrap up that we haven't covered that you'd like to share now or mention? Or forever hold your peace. No, it's been fantastic. I'm sure everyone's enjoyed themselves, but they're also like, Yanina, can you shut up? Like you've <laughs> no, talked enough. So Great stories. Well, if you're not bored of me, as you mentioned, I have my podcast. So that's Eat, Sleep, Wine, Repeat. Because that's basically what I do. I eat, I sleep, I wine, and I do repeat that. So it's quite an easy name. And yeah, you can find it on any podcast app. And of course, yeah, I'm around for weird, wonderful wine tastings. And of course, hey, the last few years has been a bit rubbish, but it has meant we've got quite virtual. So now my services are not just for England. They're for the world. I can bring my services to you. Praise be. <laughs> Praise be to the Lord! <laughs> yeah. um, okay. And it was, I don't know, I was going to try and say something from the Bible and then I, I don't know. So I'll stop now. I'll stop rambling. <laughs> Get in touch. I like to talk. Your website, I'm going to let you say it so I don't muck it up. What is your website URL? www.eatsleepwinerepeat.co.uk Okay, great. Simple. I assume that's your central hub and then we can find you on social through that and all the rest of it. Exactly. It's all there. And to be honest, it's pretty much that name. So even on Instagram, which I'm very active at eat sleep underscore wine repeat. There you go. Oh, 
And I know this is wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I can't wait till we chat again, which will be very soon on your podcast. So I'm looking forward to yes. that. Yes. Everyone come over because, <laughs> yes, Natalie will be on mine. Yay. <laughs> All right. So thank you and uh, look forward to continuing our conversation soon. Oh, lovely. Well, thank God it's not today because, you know, I'm, uh, with, I've got quite a lot of wine to drink, so I'm busy now. <laughs> well, thank God Jesus is not there right now. Anyway. <laughs> thank God. <laughs> Bye for now. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed our chat with Yanina. Here are my takeaways. Number one, British wines do have a fascinating history dating back to King Henry VIII. Now that was a man who enjoyed his food and drink. Two, it was interesting to hear how wine is made in the driest place on earth, which is in Chile. I look forward to trying some of those wines. And three, the debate about stemless wine glasses versus traditional stemware continues. In the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 171, you'll find my email contact, a link to the post called Diary of a Book Launch, the link to the Drink and Drag event, the full transcript of my conversation with Yanina, links to her website and podcast, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find the live stream video version of these conversations on Facebook and YouTube Live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Email me if you have a sip, tip, question, or would like to be a beta reader of my new book at natalie at nataliemclean.com. You won't want to miss next week when I chat with Lawrence Francis, host of the Interpreting Wine podcast. In the meantime, if you missed episode 74, go back and take a listen. I chat with Dr. Laura Catena about Malbec and her family's wineries in Argentina. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. Malbec has an extraordinary history in the world since Roman times. It was very famous in the Middle Ages when it was called Le Vin Noir, the black wine, and it was often used to enrich it. When the French had the 1855 classification, 40 to 60% of the blend of those wines was Malbec. The Bordeaux realized that with Malbec, they could add this texture and color to their wines, and so they planted it. If there's a little bit of cold weather, the yields go down dramatically. Cabernet is much tougher. Merlot is much tougher. And it's also earlier ripening. Given Malbec is such a robust wine, I would have never thought it was it's a delicate the, the, grape. What happened was that when it was brought to Argentina in 1852, it was brought as this famous French grape that was planted in Bordeaux. I had a viticulturalist from Italy. I asked him, I said, why didn't you plant some varieties from Italy here in your vineyard? And he said, the only thing that grows well and makes great wine in this vineyard of mine is Malbec. Malbec just did well. It just tasted good and it made great wine. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the wines and stories we discussed. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a full-bodied Chilean or Argentine wine. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemclean.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.